Okay. All right, Jamie, I think we're good. I'll close the door here. Okay. Sounds good. Maybe I'll, it looks like I still see some people popping in. But it looks like people who are joining at seven are here. So welcome. I'd like to call the 1218th meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington to order. Welcome everybody. Um, nice to see you um, for our February meeting. Our schedule tonight is a little bit modified to accommodate our speaker who's in a totally different time zone than, than most of us are. Um, and so he's got, you know, I think he has a, an engagement with, with uh, w one of his children to do something, uh, dentist yeah, appointment or knocked, something like that. He knocked half his tooth out on a surfboard uh, uh, and they want to see if it's still alive. So we have to go to a, not, not the uh, dentist, but whoever does the worst stuff to your mouth, that person. Uh, and my uh, wife refused to take him to that. So I had to do it. Yeah. Hawaii, Hawaii problems. That right. We, I know. We, we don't have those problems here. <laughs> Uh, yeah. um, okay, well, welcome, Dan, and I'll, I'll hand it off to, to Al Norbum, our program chair, chair to, uh, to introduce our speaker tonight. Okay, thanks, uh, Jamie. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce Dan Rubinoff. He's a professor of entomology at the University of Hawaii and director of the University of Hawaii Insect Museum. Dan earned uh, his BS in natural resources at Cornell in 1992 and a PhD from UC Berkeley in 2001. He became an assistant professor at the University of Hawaii in 2002. His research centers on the application of systematics using both DNA and morphological characters, understand the evolution and ecology of native insects and improve their conservation. Additionally, he's interested in the role phylogenetics can play in reducing the invasive species problem. His favorite parts of the research process are the times of discovery, which can happen in the field when encountering a new species or novel behavior, or in the lab when an analysis suggests an unanticipated relationship between species. He tries to translate the excitement and importance of such discoveries to a broader audience whenever possible so that the inherent value of even the most inconspicuous species can be appreciated and such lineages saved. And today he's kindly um, agreed to tell us about um, the fancy case caterpillars. So Dan, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and as I was mentioning to some folks earlier, this is the last you'll see me until the end of the talk. But um, if you have questions, uh, I'll try to pay attention in the chat or if your tradition is to save them till afterwards, I can just answer them then. Uh, there are a couple of videos and one of them might make some people nauseous. I'll just tell you in advance. So look away if that's what happens to you. Um, I'm not sure which one will make which person nauseous. There's several options there. So, um, you know, use your own discretion as we go forward. But uh, I appreciate the invitation and I'm gonna uh, share screen now. And uh, we, I, I hope people won't be shy about telling me if they can't see something because this is, uh, Working. All right. Are we good? Yeah, excuse me, Dan. I would just say, um, please, uh, people type things into the chat and then we'll try to um, forward anything important to Dan. Yeah, I may not be able to see it with uh, my share screen right now anyway, because um, I'm on full screen. But uh, let's begin. Um, I, I always have trouble giving this talk because I've been working on this group for a while and I know that there are people who haven't heard of it and I want to give you a general introduction, but I also uh, imagine people have heard it before, you know, fans of the group uh, probably want to skip to the new stuff. So I'll, it's a little bit of a combination of both, but we'll, we'll get into there um, uh, slowly. And one of the more recent fans is uh, Julian Dupuy, uh, one of the co-authors, uh, and he's now at the University of Kentucky, but it's just been fun working with him and really helping him in his journey to overcome uh, his fear of insects. So if you see him, please mention that you saw this slide. That'll, that'll really make him happy. Um, and this is Camille, one of my other co-authors and, and current postdoc here. Uh, this is Kauai, Alakai Swamp. This is probably what a lot of people think about when they uh, think of doing field work in the jungles or forests of, of Hawaii. But uh, we also have some other habitats. And I took a movie recently when we were uh, on... Um... Oops. 
So hopefully you can see this. Can people see that? Looks good. This yeah. is uh, on the lee side of Haleakala on Maui. And it just gives you a sense of the ruggedness and also the variety of uh, habitats. There's little trees you can see in the gullies. Those are endemic trees. But those are the pockets where we find uh, native insects. And there's a lot of, uh, as you can see, rocky grassland that's mostly invasive stuff in between. This is at an elevation of about 8,000 feet. Um, if you look in the distance, you can see clouds below. Uh, that's where it gets wetter. So Hawaii is pretty weird that way, where uh, it's not a situation that as you go up, it gets wetter. It does for a while, and then it gets drier and, and then extremely dry. But uh, if you're doing field work in places like this, the only way to uh, access them is by helicopter. And uh, this is just what we did for one day. Um, and over the course of this day, I'll show you guys later in the phylogeny. This is in 2019. We're finally working through the molecular data. But we picked up five new species of this moth group just in this day of uh, field work. So it's pretty remarkable uh, how diverse it is. And I, Again, that's not something I think a lot of people necessarily think about. Is everybody able to see that video okay? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, that's uh, what it looks like when you're doing the work here. One other thing I would mention is you probably saw how big that massive is, the massive that is Maui and Haleakala. And some of the mountains are just huge that way, uh, which makes it very difficult to cover them thoroughly. And I'll get into later why that is kind of important. But uh, just a quick geography lesson. This is, uh, or I guess geology too. These are the Hawaiian Islands. Um, our closest land anchor is San Francisco at 4,000 kilometers away. But we also go up from the hotspot uh, at Kilauea, which I think has been in the news a bit recently. Uh, but it goes up 1,500 kilometers to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which actually, it turns out, could be biologically significant. And that's something I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and this, of course, is what the hotspot looks like. Um, we are probably the most geologically active place on the planet, um, with good reason. Uh, but it's not just about the Big Island, which I'm circling right here with my mouse. You've got Maui, which I just showed you, Lanai, Kaha'olawe, Molokai, Oahu, where I am right now. Kauai, Niihau, and then that little bump represents all those Northwest Hawaiian Islands that goes up for another thousand kilometers. Uh, and that's what that, this looks like a little bit. You can see Nihoa, Necker, and some of these islands get pretty small as I'll show you in a minute, but they could be again, biologically significant. And that's something I kind of want to lean into as I go forward. Um, the main islands are all about 5 million years old or younger. Obviously Big Island is still forming, but is thought to be about half a million years old. But uh, if you go a little bit further back, you get into these uninhabited islands and they're between 16 and 7 million years old. And this is uh, Nihoa here. And these tend to be volcanic plugs, uh, but they still have endemic species on them. And then you get even further back, um, sorry, I went the wrong way on there. Uh, you go even further back and you get the uh, atolls and that's a uh, Lazan that I'm showing you right here. And even these atolls have endemic species on them, not in every group, but there was even a honey creeper, believe it or not, that uh, is endemic to this, the Lazan finch. And there was an endemic rail, the Lazan rail. So even birds are endemic on little tiny islands or atolls that look like that. Uh, and this is probably, you know, for talking about Hawaii and adaptive radiations, which is the thing to talk about here. Uh, this is the most famous one. These are the honey creepers. But honestly, you know, most of them are extinct and it's really wasn't that diverse to begin with, um, in my opinion. I don't mean to offend bird people. I think they're very pretty. But if we're talking about learning broader things about adaptive radiations and, and how things have evolved in Hawaii, it's better to choose a, a more diverse group. And I'm sure there are some fly people there who are thinking, of course, you should choose Drosophila. And yeah, maybe, I mean, they are certainly taxonomically diverse. There's over a thousand species. Um, are they ecologically diverse? I would say not so great. Um, they are widely distributed, but honestly, there are a thousand 
species doing pretty much the same thing. And yeah, it's very cute that heteronura males down here bang their heads together. Um, they are a, a charming group, but in terms of diversity, I think there's something a little bit more interesting uh, and that is hyposmacoma. The problem is they're kind of inconspicuous. These are what the caterpillars look like. Uh, if you really want to get into inconspicuous, this is what it's like trying to collect them. This is just a piece of bark I took off of a, a tree and there are four candy wrapper cases hidden here. And you, maybe some of you have noticed that this is one of them, but there's another one down here, another one over here, and another one here. So they're really well camouflaged. And it's no accident that they take even, in this case, the powdery lichen that's on the tree and use that to decorate their case. And you'll see in a minute that each case is very differently decorated or, or formed. And I think that's a, a real issue of camouflage. So there's diversity even just in their cases. In fact, there's so much diversity in the group that before 1978, they were put in 14 different genera, genera. Um, and afterwards, uh, Zimmerman said, no, this is probably just two subgenera, hyposmacoma and eupericis within hyposmacoma. And there's about 100 species in eupericis. I'm not going to talk about them much more today, but on the left here, you can see a new species of them that uh, we found that's a leaf miner on ferns on Kauai. Uh, but, you know, there's debate. People ask me how many species are in hyposmacoma. At the end of this, you'll have your own opinion, but uh, it's really hard to say because uh, every time we do more collecting, I find more species. And so I used to think 400, now I say 600. And I'm really not sure, but it's, it's many hundreds more than are described. And what is kind of striking about it is if you take all the species of Lepidoptera in Hawaii, one third of them are hyposmacoma. So one third of all species diversity in moths and butterflies in Hawaii belongs in this genus. So it's a really diverse genus and it's really taken off in ways that no other group here has. Um, Here's an uh, uh, Astelia feeding one. You can see there's the head, the little guys are running around, really cute with an oversized case that, that kind of bobbles along like a hermit crab. Uh, this is a jellyfish case type here, a lot of diversity there. And they live in all kinds of places. You know, we had some uh, ex-cons come out and help us look uh, from, oh wait, no, that's my postdoc Will. Sorry about that. But uh, yeah, he's on Lanai, and you can see this is a really severe habitat. You've already seen a little bit of what Kauai looks like. You find them everywhere. But what Will's staring at here, believe it or not, is this. And this is uh, Hyposmacoma turidella, endemic to Lanai, and only endemic to those barren rock field wastelands where it feeds on lichen. Um, later on, I can show you, well, we don't have time, but a cool video of one of them being attacked by a spider and winning. So uh, there's neat stuff that goes on there. But also, as I mentioned, hyposmacoma is in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So uh, keeping that in mind, there's some probably, you know, evolutionary implications from this. It means that maybe this group is older than just the main islands. And there was a publication that came out, Price and Clay, probably 20 years ago, saying most of the current lineages in Hawaii arose after Kauai uh, 5 million years ago. So this is quite here. It's the oldest of the big islands. And after that, these islands get very small, as you saw. So that was something that we thought would be interesting to look at with uh, hyposmacoma. And I'll show you Gardner Pinnacles in a, a little bit. So you can see, this is Gardner Pinnacle. It is nothing. This is the entire space of it. And yet it has a species of hyposmacoma, which is found there. And I'm just gonna remind you here, this is a uh, Gardner pinnacle right there. It's not close to anything else. It's not like, oh, well, if you threw two rocks, you could get to another island. You can't see another island from Gardner pinnacles. It's out in the middle of the ocean. And yet there's a species of hyposmacoma there. So how did it get there and what is it related to? These are questions you know we'd like to ask. Uh, in terms of just overall uh, morphological diversity, it's tremendous. You have hyposmacoma lignivora, on the left here, that's one of the largest, and Elegantula, it's one of the smallest. Elegantula has only been found near the blowhole on the east side of Oahu. It has sister species down above the splash zone on Kauai and Maui, but this species is only found here. And you can see it's very snazzy, with those uh, iridescent colors there. Uh, and also, not just morphologically, but the ecologies of hyposmacoma are pretty striking. 
Uh, we found snail eating ones. This is something that doesn't occur anywhere else in the world. There are no other snail eating caterpillars, period. Uh, we also have some that uh, are aquatic. And here you can see one levitating off a rock. Uh, these are not the same. These are different lineages. I'll, I'll try and make that clear in a couple of minutes. But these are very unusual ecologies uh, in a global sense. And just to give you a sense of, of some of the diversity, these are the different case types of hypasmacoma. And you can see some of the uh, different names we've come up for them. Bow ties, bugles, candy wrappers, clothes, cigars, dog bones, sleeping bag inside a tent. Uh, it's become desperate because you don't want to give something a number. It's so dull to say, oh, yeah, it's like case type 24 today. Very exciting. You want to say, wow, we got seven new flat purse cases today and another candy wrapper. Uh, but what that means is that you've got this real diversity that you have to describe. And as you look at each one of these, keep in mind that these don't, these aren't just one species. Each one of these represents a lineage. What that means is that this cone case here has a representative on Kauai. I'll, I'll spill the beans right now. It also has one on Gardner Pinnacles, Lazan, Nihoa, uh, and every other island except Big Island has a cone case hypasmacoma, and they are different species. So this represents, you know, six or eight species. This represents about 10 to 12 species. There are flat purses and uh, regular purses. And these are two different lineages that are actually not closely related. So this is convergent evolution towards this uh, uh, case form. This one feeds in dead tree fern fronds, and this one in rotting wood. So that's the kind of diversity that we're, we're grappling with. Um, and of course, these are the carnivores right here. And we'll see a little bit more about them. This is what it looks like when we're doing the, the field work. We collect a caterpillar, we try to take a picture of it eating whatever it's eating, and then we get the adult out. And here you can see this is a snail eater uh, from Kauai. So uh, that's how it looks. We have uh, the, the log number is probably way out of date. We probably have 2,500 different logs, and we're probably closing in on 10,000 reared specimens. Um, here you can see some aquatic cone case hypasmacoma, all sharing a bunk just above uh, the waterline here. Definitely not COVID safe, but they are, um, this is where they typically roost and also pupate. Uh, just for the record, there's an invasive ant there patrolling, but these guys seem to be able to handle them. Uh, we don't think that's true for other uh, native uh, invertebrates, by the way. We think the invasive ants are a real problem. Here's a different kind of habitat. This is uh, Heilani Stream. Uh, in Kipahulu National Park on uh, Maui. And if you look close on the rocks in the splash zone here, you can see a different aquatic case type. This is a burrito case type. And if it's hard for you to see there, uh, this is what they look like when you take them off the rocks. And just to be clear, yes, there's lichen on the top side, but the larvae seem to be able to orient and they don't waste time decorating the underside of their cases, the side that's not exposed, which is kind of remarkable if you think about it. Um, and Again, these are truly aquatic caterpillars. I'm gonna show you a video in a second. Uh, and you can see the cone cases here uh, are in the water. And before I show you this though, I should say that only 0.5% of all Lepidoptera have the ability to, uh, or have aquatic larvae. So it's a very unusual thing. But, uh, sorry about that. This is a video we took with uh, NHK, which is uh, Japanese public television. You can see uh, a burrito case hypasmacoma underwater here, and you'll see a natural predator come up and uh, flick it off the rock. And it's holding on with uh, silk tie downs. So these aquatic caterpillars are not casually wandering into the water. When they're in the water, uh, and presumably at other times when they're in the splash zone of these streams, they uh, attach themselves to the substrate with silk lines. And then if they are dislodged, which you can imagine would happen, we had six inches of rain yesterday. So major floods happen frequently. They are able, like a rock climber knocked off a wall, to pull themselves tarsi by tarsi back down onto the substrate. And you'll see uh, this guy gets the uh, old nod of approval from me um, for doing a good job there. But uh, they are remarkable in their ability to do that kind of stuff. Um, and that kind of adaptation 
surely has to be monophyletic in Hawaii because as we you know, just said, 0.5% of all Lepidoptera caterpillars are aquatic. So that means that globally, this is a very rare event. And therefore it's remarkable that it happened at all in Hawaii, but it surely must have happened once, right? I mean, how else could something like that happen? And here again is a cone case. You saw a burrito case. And here's a different burrito uh, cased adult, just so you can see what the adults look like. So one of the questions that we're talking about novel niches in aquatic uh, hyposmacoma is, you know, is this a one-off thing? Did it lead to much diversity? And how many species of aquatic hyposmacoma are there? Before we started doing this work, there were none described. It just seems odd considering how remarkable this habit is and the fact that it occurs on all the main islands that have open water but nobody seems to have noticed it beforehand or they just didn't want to see it because um, it, it is kind of a tangle. And also what are the, uh, the evolutionary units for these, this group on the different islands? Uh, and finally, I've already shown you that there are burrito aquatic uh, hyposmacoma and there are cone cased aquatic hyposmacoma. So surely these are the same lineage, right? That then diversified into burritos and into cones. Otherwise, they're making it look easy to get aquatic, uh, which it shouldn't be. And for this uh, part of the project, we use traditional Sanger sequencing, including nuclear and mitochondrial genes. Um, for the results, I do want to draw your attention to uh, Kauai and two spots there. This is Kokei. That's where I took that picture of Camille. And then we have Uhau Aioli, which is another stream. So that's on Kauai. And then if we look on Maui, I also want to orient you on this because when you see the results, it'll make some sense. This is West Maui. This is the north side of East Maui. This is Heilani Stream. I showed you a picture of that earlier. And this is the Kaupo Gap on the south side of Maui. Now the Kaupo Gap is similar habitat to that helicopter video I showed you. So it kind of occurs along this whole southern escarpment of Maui. It's dry, open scree. But Kaupo Gap and Heilani Stream are only about two kilometers away from each other as the helicopter flies. So very close, right? And these are the results. Uh, this again, isn't just aquatic hyposmacoma, but the aquatic ones are in blue. So black represents the other hyposmacoma lineages, which I showed you, but they don't have aquatic members. So they're just there for reference. You can see that this is part of a bigger phylogeny. Uh, and if we hone in, let's hone in first on the burrito cases here. You can see burrito cases. Okay, so on Maui, we have terrestrial burrito cases and on Oahu, we have terrestrial burrito cases. They're uh, basal to this inner group, which has aquatic burritos on Kauai. And then inside there, we have Lanai, that includes Turidella, that species you saw in those dry wastelands. But then we have another burrito species that's terrestrial. Molokai, again, comes in, Oahu comes in. And then in this internal group, that's where we find this Maui aquatic and Big Island aquatic burrito with a sister taxon that's terrestrial on Oahu. And if we really get into this, the Kaupo Gap, that spot I showed you near where I helicoptered in, that, that area, which is only two kilometers from Heilani Stream, they're completely unrelated to each other. They're both burrito cases. This one's terrestrial, this one's aquatic, but this aquatic one in Heilani Stream is more closely related to a terrestrial burrito we've collected on Oahu than it is to another terrestrial burrito three kilometers away on the same island just ridiculous and not helpful when you're trying to sort things out. Then I didn't even mention to you guys that there's a bugle case that's aquatic. So there are two species of that uh, that are aquatic on Kauai and then several that are terrestrial. We get them on Maui, Kauai. If I'd had room, I'd shown you we have a terrestrial one on Oahu, but you get the point, which is that these different lineages are popping up legitimate aquatic caterpillars. And even worse, the cones. And here you can see those two uh, places I showed you on the same island, on Kauai, which is the smallest of the main hot, high islands still. Uh, and uh, Kokei, which I showed you where Camille was, we get a species of cone-cased hyposmacoma that's aquatic. And then around the same island, so just drive around in about two and a half hours, you get to the Uhau Aioli stream area. And there we have two different species of cone case aquatic hyposmacoma in the same stream. And I have theories about why that is, which I can talk about afterwards, but in the same stream, two different easily diagnosable species of aquatic hyposmacoma with the same case type. 
Um, when we do uh, uh, comparative methods reconstruction, you can see that there are at least, actually, to be honest with you, there are four different uh, derivations of the aquatic habit in this group. Uh, and this is something, again, 0.5% on a global scale, and hyposmacoma has done this apparently just for fun, more than uh, three times. And I would say it's actually going to be more than four times when we get all the species together and start looking at this more carefully. Uh, some things that are concerning about that are that these are all 100%, not just single island, but single volcano endemics. And what that means is that if you find uh, an aquatic hyposmacoma on East Maui, it is not the same as a species on West Maui. And on Oahu, we have the Ko'ola Mountains and the Waianae Mountains, 100% different species in these two mountain ranges. So we have an intense amount of divergence in species. What I already showed you there is the islands aren't even monophyletic. So if you get a cone case hyposmacoma on West Maui, its closest relative is on Molokai, not on East Maui. Um, and to be fair, hyposmacoma is not unusual for this. Uh, Jim Lieb here was seeing the same things with his carabids in many cases. But uh, again, this radiation has no respect for biogeography and it's at least several multiple, uh, several uh, aquatic invasions that are going on there. Um, we're trying to figure out how they're doing this and why they keep going in and out of the water quite literally. Um, that's something we're hoping that some functional genomics will help with. And, and that's something we're working on actively right now. Um, just to switch slightly to a more gruesome gear, uh, we also have these carnivorous hyposmacoma. And I always like to start with the aquatic ones because you know people think 0.5% is rare. And then when you show them 0.13%, that's really rare. And 0.13% is the percentage of caterpillars globally that are carnivorous. As I mentioned already, there are no other snail eating caterpillars on the planet, at least that I or anybody else who speaks to me is aware of. Uh, so that's a really unusual uh, habit. And just to give you a sense of what that looks like, um, First, uh, I want to show you the adult, which I think is pretty adorable. We'll only look at this for a minute, but hyposmacoma adults are really spastic, so you rarely get a chance to see them without them taking off. But this one had just emerged, and you can just see the tufts of uh, scales on it. It's got a, a red eye, which is a little bit hard to see, but uh, just kind of a cool moth. Um, in a second, it literally disappears because it just flicks out of the screen. So I'm not going to make you watch that, but if you like moths, it's fun to see that. Um, and if you don't, hopefully that wasn't too painful. Uh, but this is what uh, different species of hyposmacoma look like when they're attacking different snails. Um, and each time this scene changes uh, over the next minute and 20 seconds, you'll see a different species of hyposmacoma. This one is from Molokaidi, and it's spinning down a Tornitolides snail uh, from there. You can see it's spinning the silk from the shell to the substrate. Uh, when we're talking about this in an evolutionary sense, What's interesting about the way they eat snails is they don't just come right in and, and attack them. And here's a good way to see that. You can see the snail is woken up midway through the attack. The larva is up here on the shell, uh, and it had just started to spin this thing down, but it hasn't really finished. It doesn't go in and start biting the snail and attacking it. Uh, if you did this in the rainforest, the snail would drop from the leaf to the forest floor, and you would never find it again. Uh, and the chance that you'd fall with it is pretty low, and who wants to be on the forest floor anyway? But what they do, and here you can see the snail has just given up, and the snail's retreated back into the, the shell there. Uh, what they do is spin them down without disturbing them, and then go in, as you'll see here in just a second, and start to eat it once there's no way the snail can get away. So my point with that is that this is a fairly evolutionarily specific way of catching prey. It's not casual. Here you can see the uh, caterpillar is up inside the snail shell. There's the snail getting bitten. Each time it gets bitten, it kind of retreats a little bit further back. Uh, sure. But these guys are, are pretty voracious and they'll attack any snail that they can overcome, essentially. So this is a pretty specific evolutionary uh, strategy that is not, you would think, casual to come across. Uh, so in this case, we would expect it to be uh, somewhat uh, there should only be one group of them. And I'll, I'll let you know that they are monophyletic, thankfully, because that would have been hard to explain otherwise. But it's still, this is the only place that that occurs and it's quite rare. Uh, that's what the adult looks like there. Um, 
One of the things we picked up in the process of studying the carnivorous ones was uh, this, what my postdoc uh, Patrick Schmitz called the CSI case. And that's because it has the body parts of mites and other insects attached to uh, the case that it crawls around in. Um, it's known from only one site in the Waianae Mountains and it's a generalist meat scavenger. So it doesn't attack like those snail eaters that I showed you, but it does seem to like protein. It focuses on that. And we're not sure if it hasn't eaten the things that it then decorates its case with. Uh, so we wanted to understand that a little bit more and we focused on, on the carnivores in terms of understanding maybe their evolution and the relationship to each other because they occur on all the islands. Uh, and here, just for confirmation, we've used outgroups. This is the candy wrapper clade. Uh, this is a smaller genetic set, but I'll, I'll show you why I, I started with this to, to begin with. And each lineage is color coded. So Oahu's red, Kauai you can see is purple, uh, Maui's in there too. Uh, but this is what it looks like. They are monophyletic, it turns out. The carnivores thankfully are. But we have a real lack of basal resolution. And what that means is I can't tell you how each of these species is related to the other ones. Uh, and it turns out when we study them a little bit more, we realize that some of them only eat snails. Other ones, uh, and if there's time, I'll show you, will attack other hyposmacoma and eat them. So some of them are much more flexible in what they'll attack. How did this happen? We're trying to, to, to piece this together, but it seems to have happened very quickly, whatever it was, because there's very little support, uh, lack of basal resolution. And if we add more data, you might think, oh, add more data, that'll solve it. Uh, even with five genes, we're not able to sort this out. We still get very low support. Obviously, right now, we're working on whole genome sequencing. And so we hope with the full load and the full measure, we should be able to say, say something definitive about how these uh, different groups uh, or different species within the group have evolved. But it's really hard to know for sure, uh, at least at this point. What we can say, though, is when we time it, is that it's an ancient split. And it turns out that that one on Oahu uh, the CSI case that doesn't actually attack live prey, but doesn't mind eating, you know, impaired things. Uh, it is basal to the rest of these proper attacking hunting carnivores. So uh, here we can see them eating snails, eating other hyposmacoma. Uh, they're up here and they seem to have radiated about uh, 3.8 million years ago, but carnivory, that is the split between the CSI case and the rest of them seems to have happened about 7.5 million years ago which is considerably before Kauai was around. Uh, so that is not uh, the case um, here, that, that, that this all happened uh, <laughs> relatively recently. And what that means is that each of these species lineages that popped out, uh, popped out from something that presumably evolved uh, around the time that Nihoa was one of the largest islands and it's barely a plug right now. One of the things that bugs us with this is that we keep trying to find CSI cases on other islands and we can't, and we don't know why. Uh, we know that this case type, as you can see here, is older than Oahu, it's older than Kauai. That means that something, its ancestor, something related to it, but not a, a proper hunting carnivore has been around for a long time. And presumably it's hiding out at least on Kauai, but it may have gone extinct. And that's the quirk of, of working in Hawaii is we may have lucked out in finding the last one of this unique lineage, this lineage hiding out in uh, the Waianae Mountains on Oahu, uh, which is kind of interesting to think about. And again, as I, as I mentioned, this is a really rapid diversification. Uh, the main clade seems to be on Kauai, but it has dispersed to all of the younger islands. And one of the questions that, that people talk about a lot is, and this is in, in discussing conservation, but is sloth, single large or several small, right? Which one would be better? Uh, Hawaii offers a little bit of, of a sort of examination of that because you can look at, at Big Island, which is more than twice as big as the other islands combined. And we only have two species of carnivorous uh, hypossomacoma. You go to the Maui Nui complex and you get five species. And we call this the Maui Nui complex because up until 10,000 years ago, this was all one big island. Um, and uh, then when sea levels rose, it isolated them. But functionally, in a lot of ways, they, they have uh, biogeographic affinities that you don't see with the other islands. Then we go to Oahu and you get three species. And then we go to the oldest and the smallest of these islands and you get nine species. So Kauai by far has the most species of carnivorous hyposmacoma, uh, even though it's the smallest, which suggests to me that this is more of a relationship with age 
than it is with the size of the, the, the land, unless you consider half a million years not enough to work from. Uh, and maybe that is the case. But uh, otherwise, I would suggest that having these older islands is probably really important in generating or maintaining this diversity, because not all of the Kauai species are older, right? You see basal ones down here, but you can see a lot of the new um, groups of, of carnivores are still popping up on Kauai. So um, again, this is not a recently derived lineage, even though it's very unusual uh, globally, it arose probably at least 7 million years ago on uh, an island older than Kauai. Um, and even though Kauai is the center of diversity now, it is not the oldest um, or the origin of these of this group. So people, I mean, this, this is an old trope, you know, center of diversity, center of origin. We're very sure the center of origin uh, for these carnivores is on an older island that no longer harbors them, but the most diversity is on Kauai at this time. And the interesting thing there, uh, I didn't have a chance to focus more on this, but is that snail specialization evolved earlier than some of these more generalist uh, carnivores that attack other caterpillars. So even the specialization on snails, if you can imagine it, was happening on islands that are seven or six million years old, six million years ago. Uh, and that's such an unusual habit that has persisted for, for the last several million years. Getting back to, uh, the group as a whole, just to remind you of, of what the overall diversity looks like. I think sometimes at this point in the talk, people think that there are only cones and, uh, and snail eaters and maybe burritos. We have all these other case types doing different things. And uh, again, I'd love to talk more about that, but time is of essence. Um, but if we put all these species together into one analysis and ask the question, how is this adaptive uh, radiation functioning? Uh, the thing to keep in mind there is that if you're doing a proper adaptive radiation, you have one colonist go from, say, Kauai, one hyposmacoma goes from there, arrives on Oahu, and then it adaptively radiates into all these different niches that a hyposmacoma um, inhabits now. And then you'd expect, if this was an adaptive radiation, for one from Oahu to arrive on, say, Maui Nui and then explode and do the same thing. And Rosie Gillespie has shown this with her spiders. They do this adaptive radiation. So what you would end up with then is that each island is monophyletic. When you look at the phylogeny, you would expect to have all the things from Oahu be each other's closest relative, even though they're very different in their ecologies because they have adaptively radiated. So if we do that, when I circle the, these groups, they should all go by island. But in fact, what you see is quite the opposite. Each of these case types is multicolored because each case type has representatives on each island. And so what that means is that this is a radiation very much, but not necessarily what you call a currently adapting radiation. Because if you're a candy wrapper, you're doing the same thing on Kauai as you're doing on Oahu, as you're doing on Maui, Molokai, Lanai, and Big Island. And it's cool what you're doing but your relatives are other candy wrappers on other islands and that's how it goes. The same thing goes for almost every group except burritos. Here you can see we've got burritos popping up here and here, there's a whole bunch of burritos. Uh, and the first case it turns out is convergent evolution. So in a couple of situations there, we have two lineages which are sharing the same case type but are actually not each other's closest relatives. And that's just a shortcoming on our, fault, our, our part that we can't tell them apart but they're clearly diversifying across the islands in the same broad functional group. And uh, just to show you what that looks like uh, honing in on Maui alone, all I want you to see is that there's a splash of red all the way across this phylogeny. And the reason I wanted to show this is it's one of our more most recent phylogenies. And this includes that stuff that I collected when I was doing that helicopter run that I showed you the video for. So you have different hyposmacoma doing this from different groups in the same place on each island. So you, you helicopter into a random place on Maui and you're gonna pick up a lignivora, a crab, a candy wrapper, a burrito, each of them in this case being a new species that we haven't seen before because you're in a new spot. So we had uh, several new species. I said four, but it's more than four uh, from one day of field work on Maui. And uh, just closing out some of the broader thoughts uh, to have with hyposmacoma. Um, one is that all these species, when we do this work, are single island, and not only that, but single volcano endemics. 
They're part of species complexes, but each species is only found in one spot on one volcano. Um, and again, many islands have more than one volcano. That includes Oahu, which has two. Um, what's interesting is when I, what I circled here are each of the species groups. And you can kind of see what that looks like. 14 different case lineages. Um, all of the lineages are well supported with our data. Our molecular data says, yeah, these are all monophyletic. But the radiation itself down here at the base, we have no idea how these different lineages are related to each other. So this happened very quickly at the, the origin of hypothesis where they just went nuts and diversified into all these case types so quickly that the molecular evidence is pretty limited. And again, we're working on genomic stuff for that right now. But uh, as you can see here, are the different case types, the one pattern we think might hold is that there's single opening versus double opening cases and the single opening cases tend, uh, seem to be monophyletic at this point. So that means there was a big shift here between these double opening case types and then one group sealed one into their case and really diversified. And as it turns out, we have many more species in this group or, and also more abundant species uh, in the single opening case type. So that seems to have been a pretty important shift for hypasmacoma. Again, we'd like to confirm this with ongoing uh, genomic data that we're working on right now. This is the stuff uh, I was talking about, single opening and double opening case types, but um, it's a pretty interesting group. And, and just to conclude, we've got a genome and right now we're gonna be doing some whole, whole genome sequencing, um, hopefully with a little bit of help from a funding agency of some kind or another. But uh, our genome is really high quality. Uh, and you can see that here, here's Kaha Manoa. The width of the orange gives you a sense just graphically of the quality of the genome that we have and the length. Hypothesis uh, genome is relatively big compared to things like Heliconia, Spomix mori or Plutella. Um, and we have really nice uh, pieces that are relatively large. So when we're trying to assemble our scaffold, we're very, we're, we're likely to have a higher quality genome and be more certain of, of the placement of, uh, uh, the, basically the entire genomic sequence than we would if we had smaller pieces where there would be something a little bit more um, arbitrary. So we're really primed to do the work. We're at the top of the mountain and we're about to head down uh, and it should get pretty exciting from here on in with hopefully a few loops uh, to figure out how hypothesis has evolved. Um, thanks very much. Uh, as I conclude, I just wanna show you some pictures of folks from my lab. Um, actually, she's not from my lab and neither is he, but but the rest of them are. And, uh, you know, we couldn't have done this without a, a slew of people over the last 15 years. So, uh, and agencies, of course, that have funded this. So uh, thanks very much. I welcome your questions. I didn't see any. Oh, there they are. Sorry, I wasn't able to see those when I was, uh, when I was speaking. Uh, do people want to ask their questions again? Or? Uh, yeah, um, I guess, I can Matt, I them. can... Uh... Or, it looks like yeah, I can read them to you here. Um, I see why Trichoptera are sometimes called aquatic Lepidoptera. Uh, sounds like fighting words. So uh, David Ansky asked, are there, are there mandibular, mandibular differences amongst the larvae that uh, have different uh, feeding modes? So we've looked at several of them and haven't been able to notice or haven't found anything particularly remarkable in that. Uh, what we're hoping to do now with the genomic work is actually look at, at the functional genomics of the carnivores and see how they differ from their herbivorous relatives. Like by sampling the whole genome and hopefully being able to find those spots that are indicative of metabolic differences, we'll be able to pinpoint how something shifts from eating plants and decaying material to attacking its relatives and snails uh, effectively. Similarly, we, we're gonna look at the aquatic ones that way uh, to see how they're able to, to essentially go underwater indefinitely when you know, so many of the relatives can't. Uh, oh, Dan? Dan? How are the, uh, the clades dispersing between the islands? Man, I would love to know. I think a blender, I think they're using a blender because, uh, and I could go back and show you the, the phylogeny, but one of the things you should have noticed or probably noticed was the confusion. The fact that the south side of East Maui has its closest relative on Oahu and the north side of East Maui has its closest relative on Big Island. So quite literally, they came from opposite directions and colonized uh, a similar area, which, you know, broadly speaking, makes no sense. Um, talking about that a little bit with Kauai, remember the, that stream Uhawaioli has two distinct species of cone-cased aquatic hypothesis two species. 
How did that happen? I have absolutely no evidence for this, but I believe Kauai, let's keep in mind, is 5 million years old. At its peak, it was much bigger, right? Not necessarily as big as Big Island, but much bigger than it was. And it had peaks over, right now it's at 4,000 feet. It probably safely had peaks of 9,000 feet. So let's go back, you know, 3 million years, right? And then Kauai is still a 2 million year old island. So older than Maui is now, just to give you a sense. So that's a big island. It's an older island. It has streams flowing down different sides of it. These two cone case type hyposmacoma get isolated on each side of this island, evolve into different species. And then over the next 3 million years through stream capture and erosion, they end up stuck in the same stream. Um, that's the only thing that really makes sense to me because otherwise, why wouldn't we find them up in Kokei where we don't find them? There are cone cased aquatic hyposmacoma in Kokei. They're related to the other, the other two, but they are not the same. So uh, that's, that's what we're guessing with that one. Um, let's see, other species that feed is leaf miners, a monophyletic group. Um, we don't know enough about the ones that feed on ferns. We definitely know there are multiple species feeding on ferns and feeding on different parts of ferns. So uh, I showed you a quick picture of Euparisis. Euparisis is the sister genus. I think it's a genus. We can call it a subgenus for now uh, to the rest of Hyposmacoma. They are much less diverse. They're only about 150 species uh, and they're naked. So they're boring into things. Um, I collected some random moss uh, up in Kauai to rear a xylorictid larva and a Euparisis larva popped out and we got a, an adult that we'd never seen before. So literally getting a random square of moss from uh, somewhere in the forest can generate a new species. But these larvae are really cryptic. They're creeping around in different things. Um, they are attacking ferns. Then we have uh, two different radiations of uh, the cone or the, the case bearing ones that are in dead fern fronds. And I don't know if that counts as feeding on ferns to you, maybe because uh, you know, the toxins have decomposed and the, and the plants are, are not as toxic. You wouldn't consider that an adaptation to handling fern, but we, if you wanna catch those, you have to break open fern fronds, not on the ground, but dead on the, the plant uh, to find those caterpillars. And, and you can find them. Um, I think that's a really good question about the ferns. Uh, as we get more data and we start to find out what different species eat, we might be able to answer uh, more of those. But right now, if I had to guess, I'd say it's monophyletic in the case-bearing ones, and I have no idea for the, the naked ones, honestly. Um, spate caused um, extirpation of any aquatic taxa. So I, don't, I would say there's a, an absence of knowledge there. Nobody was collecting these before we started. So the data we have is pretty limited. The only cone case hyposmacoma that uh, we were aware of before we started our work was a terrestrial one on, in the Waianae Mountains of Oahu, which Zimmerman for some reason thought was the same species as something from Nihoa. Nihoa is 500 miles northwest of here and it's a little volcanic plug. Um, they're both cone cases, but obviously, as you probably know now, they are not even close to being the same species. Um, having said that, I have no sense of, of what historical uh, extinction patterns would have been with this group. Um, I would say the aquatic ones might be more resilient than the others, uh, if only because uh, we still find them, you know, even low down. If we want to get hyposmacoma to rear for, for showing kids or whatever it is, I can just pop over to the stream near my house and get cone cased hyposmacoma in it. There is no other hyposmacoma I can get easily in Manoa Valley anymore. I'd have to go for a hike to find one of the terrestrial ones. So I wonder if being aquatic hasn't protected them to some degree because with flash floods and all that kind of stuff, you're not getting the same levels of predation from ants. Maybe the, the habitat hasn't been uh, as disrupted in some cases. Uh, again, I'm conjecturing, but, but that's what I guess about extinction of, of the aquatic ones. Um, <laughs> Dan Gruner asks if, uh, if the dispersal was stuck to birds or in adults in high winds. Um, I'd go with the uh, adults in high winds. Uh, Hyposmacoma are uh, like the cocker spaniels of moths. They don't hold still at all. That's why if you guys probably weren't as excited as I was to show you that, that uh, video of the snail eater holding still. But usually what you see is a blur. In fact, one of the easiest ways to tell uh, hyposmacoma is because of the frenetic 
nature of the, the adults just bouncing around. So I can't see one holding still on a bird or anything else for long enough to get anywhere, honestly. Um, so I'm guessing it's probably they themselves that are flying between the islands getting blown around on occasion. And I think they figured out the sweet spot to be dispersive enough that you can get to other islands, but not so dispersive that you get around enough to maintain genetic contact. Uh, to compare that to say Vanessa Tamehameha, our endemic uh, nymphalid, uh, we see some structure, but it's clear that the adults are getting between the islands pretty regularly. And it's probably all one species with some variation on Kauai. Uh, Hyposmacoma is, is clearly not able to do that. And it probably doesn't surprise anybody here that a Vanessa is better at going between islands than a tiny moth. But the patterns seem to, uh, to, to support that. Uh, is morphology useful than phylogeny? Seem to be, yeah, yeah. So we started out with that. Um, thank you, by the way, for the compliments. I sincerely appreciate it. It just seems egotistical to read that part of your comment. So I'm not reading the compliments, but I, I do appreciate them. Um, so uh, we started with morphology and uh, one of the things I'd like to write a paper on uh, when I have enough uh, evidence from enough different groups of hypospincoma is I don't think there's much selection on genetic or genitalic variation. We do a lot, a lot of dissections. And I got to tell you, within each group, so if you're looking at a purse case versus a cone case, they look like completely different families. I mean, the way the soci are structured, you wouldn't think they were closely related at all. But within each one, they're indistinguishable. So we decide, we've dissected a whole bunch of cone case hyposmacoma from Manoa stream here next to campus and compared them to the one from the Waianais and you know, Kauai will dissect tons of these things. And we see minimal differences in the genitalia. But what we do see is huge differences in, in the genetics. And uh, it was hard at first to feel good about describing these different species because we couldn't really say anything besides, hey, if you're on Oahu, in the koalaus, this is the species you're going to get. If you go to Kauai, you're going to get something that looks pretty similar, especially if you if you do the tails. But trust us, the genetic variation is huge. See, here it is. So almost every time we describe species of hyposmacoma, we include a phylogeny just so people understand, hey, yeah, this is for real. Look, look at this variation here. Uh, but I think that for whatever reason, there isn't strong selection for them to evolve divergent genitalia. And so they aren't bothering to do that within species groups, but between them, you know, conversely, there's huge variation. Um, sometimes I show genitalia pictures during my talks, but I figured with, with people who weren't keenly interested in microleptoptera that might lose some people, understandably. Um, <laughs> oh, this is great. The padded room for uh, the person who studies hyposmacoma. Absolutely. I think some people would say I started off in a padded room and then started studying hyposmacoma. So I was probably pre-adapted for that. Um, yeah, yeah, I love reading his quotes uh, at the beginning of talks, uh, you know, about wandering off into the darkness and that hyposmacoma will never be more than partially understood. Um, and if you were using morphology, I completely agree with him. Uh, it, it is baffling. All you can see is overwhelming diversity. What's been really fun about uh, the molecular work is, is we've started to see patterns and some of them make sense. Not all of them, but some of them make sense. And, and so that's been kind of exciting. Um, it's still fun uh, getting new emergences. Uh, we have a stack of uh, Petri dishes next door with collections we made last week uh, in, a, in a reserve uh, in the Waianae Mountains. And just seeing stuff pop out or even the parasitoids that pop out has been, it's still really exciting because we're constantly finding new stuff. Um, I've had people express justifiably frustration because sometimes they'll say there's 400, sometimes they'll say there's 600, sometimes they'll say there's 800 species of hyposmacoma. And it just depends on how recently we've collected more and how discouraged I am about how, how long it's gonna to take to understand their diversity. Because every time we rear a bunch, we get new ones, even in a place we've been 15 times on this island. And so at some point you're like, when is this gonna stop? You know, if you do that and you do an asymptote, it just doesn't go anywhere you never start to, to round off. And so if I projected that, I'd say, yeah, 800 species is safe. But you know, without the evidence, I, I have not identified 800 species. We've probably safely gotten to 600 now. Um, I can't promise that there are 800, but it's just crazy diversity here. Uh, what is the closest relative? Um, not on Hawaii. I would love to know. It turns out, um, and I don't mean this in a braggy way at all. I mean it because I think most people don't care about tiny cosmopterigids. 
but there isn't much work on the phylogenetics of them anywhere else. And in fact, when we first started doing this uh, and I tried to get an NSF, they said, you have to prove it's monophyletic. And I thought, well, if nobody else has worked on cosmopterygids, I'd have to do a global phylogeny of them to demonstrate that. Uh, eventually we were, what we were able to do is go collecting in uh, Tahiti and the South Pacific, uh, colleagues in Taiwan uh, sent us cosmopterygids and then we got some from California and we put them all in and it shows that it's pretty distinct. Um, in fact, when we use a molecular clock, it looks like it's been at least 12 to 14 million years since Hyposmocoma got here. So that would put us back in the Miocene. Uh, and what that means is the biota here is older than it is in large parts of California, right? Because that was underwater at that time. Um, and sometimes I'll start a talk by showing a picture of the globe during the Miocene and you realize how different it is in so many other places. And yet here, I don't want to say it's the same, but there have been islands above uh, water here for that period of time, for about 20 million years. And so in some ways, this is a very old system, as long as you're able to get between the islands and take advantage of that. Uh, oh, uh, oh, oh, why is this a huge radiation? I have no idea, honestly. Um, I think it's a combination of luck uh, being the right uh, substrate that is hyposmacoma. You're, you're not necessarily tied to one family of plants. So you're able to diversify and use a whole bunch of different, uh, I guess I would say ecosystems from the splash zone all the way up to 10,000 feet in the mountains in the Alpine deserts. Um, I think coming in pre uh, disposed to do that has made them able to capitalize on all the different environments and then being small and, you know, probably in that sweet spot of getting between islands, but not doing it very well has allowed them to diversify. So one of the arguments you know, I make is, yeah, there aren't as many species of hyposmacoma as there are of Drosophila, but they do so many different things that, that uh, Drosophila really don't do that it makes them more diverse in that way. And um, that, that's probably part of the reason they've been so successful here. And they've been disproportionately successful. Hawaii's not fun for everybody. There are a lot of groups that get here and they're just one thing. You know, there's so many Noctua genera that have one species here um, or uh, one species on one island and that's it, you know, and that's not very exciting. So not everybody gets to, to do what they want here, but if you have the right combination like hyposmacoma, you can really take advantage and become a third of the biota in your, in your class. Oh, I mean your order, sorry. Um, so we do rear out parasitoids from the aquatic ones, which is crazy, right? Because how are they doing that? Uh, Carl Manyaka, who's here, uh, has been working on Serica, uh, an endemic radiation of um, uh, parasitoids, uh, wasps, obviously. Uh, and I don't know if he's seen them go underwater. We haven't uh, yet, but we do uh, not infrequently rear out parasitoids. Um, I'd say we get them out of the terrestrial species more often, but we definitely do see them uh, in the aquatic ones too. To be fair, the aquatic ones aren't always underwater. Uh, one of the reasons I think that we have aquatic ones here is because we have flash floods all the time. You know, we get six inches of rain this week, we got six inches of rain last week. And so the stream goes from this to this. And if you're living stream side, you're gonna be underwater for 48 hours, whether you like it or not. And then you're gonna be dry again and everything's gonna be great. So during those dry periods, I imagine that some of these aquatic ones are getting parasitized. That doesn't mean the aquatic ones aren't underwater too, but they also hang out at the water's edge. Um, a single origin for the case type opening, uh, what ecological opportunity or selective advantages does a single opening case confer? Yeah, that is a great question. I would love to know what is special about a single case type, uh, single case opening versus a uh, double case opening. I, all we've just identified that that seems to be a pattern. I'd like to see it backed up with the genomic data and then we can go forward and start making up stories about why we think that happened, but it's, I'm not gonna lie, I, at this point, I can't really say. Um, it does seem like the double case type openings are more ecologically diverse, but in terms of just uh, success, the single case type openings, so that would be your burritos, your oysters, your, uh, your cone cases, they seem to be the most specious across the islands and certainly uh, the most abundant. Um, and we do obviously keep the parasitoids and now we're, we're freezing them and, and hopefully we'll be able to get something together. Um, yes, many parasitoids can go underwater, right. But, but the neat thing about that is that means that here, you would have had to have a terrestrial parasitoid evolve species that now will go underwater and hunt in streams. So that's what's cool about it is it's stupid 
that hyposmacoma did that, right? The 0.5% of all Lepidoptera are aquatic. The chance that the ancestor of hyposmacoma coming here was aquatic, I think is safely zero um, or close to it. So they evolved repeatedly these invasions of the water and then the wasps that attacked them said, yeah, we'll do that too. And, and they're going in after them. I think that's what's amazing about it is, yeah, there's something about Hawaii that that seems to invent that. Um, I, I can't say, you know, what's going on with that exactly. I'd love to know a little bit more. Um, but yeah, we, the, the parasitoids is a whole nother layer of diversity on top of this. Um, and you'd, you'd figure they had to be uh, specialists a little bit themselves, because if you're hunting on eucalyptus bark uh, for lichen feeders, you're probably not going to be uh, very good at finding cone cases at the water's edge or, or even underwater, or going through leaf litter trying to find the burrito cases. Uh, I could go on, you know, but there's a lot of confusing stuff there. Did I miss anybody's uh, questions? I really appreciate them. Uh, but I think I got them. If, if I didn't answer your question, please uh, pop it up again. And I Dan, will, uh, just the, regarding the openings and the- um, Yeah, I never met a Zimmerman, uh, but I, I've obviously read a lot of his work because uh, for people who don't know, Elwood Zimmerman was, I think, employed by the, I know by the Hawaiian Sugar Planters Association, which for some crazy reason supported endemic insect work. I, I suspect they didn't know what they were paying for. I mean, it's awesome. But I just can't imagine, you know, knowing the other things they did that they were like, yeah, you guys go in the forest and collect tiny moths and rear them. That'll be great. Um, but uh, they did a tremendous amount of early work. And some of the stuff we have is only from uh, the work that they did. But Elwood Zimmerman was a coleopterist. And yet he did the definitive work on virtually every group uh, up until, you know, 1978. Uh, and then obviously other people have, have stepped in since then, you know, like Jim Lever has, has put forward the, the Carabin. Uh, book for Hawaii now, but uh, just the idea that this guy who wasn't even uh, a lepidopterist covered all the groups here, updated everything, and and did it so well is is kind of astonishing. Um, it's definitely you know contributed to my feelings of inadequacy. I'll tell you that um, I work on one fraction of what he did, and and I'm not doing nearly as much. Uh, Oh, a ripple to get through the surface tension. Yeah, uh, just to answer that, yeah, these are streams. And I should have mentioned perhaps that the aquatic hyposmacoma are only in actively moving streams. The first time I collected them, I, uh, yes, Dan Adi does crickets. Yes, that's true, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I could go through, there's lots of people since then who have done a lot of work in Hawaii. I didn't mean to say that. I was mostly trying to compliment Elwood Zimmerman, not disparage all the other entomologists who work here. Um, but, um, yeah, so uh, the first time I collected aquatic hypothesmacoma, I killed them by putting them in a tub of water with a rock in my apartment. And in the morning, it smelled like hell, and I went out, and they were all floating and dead. And it turns out, uh, and this is something we've written about a little bit, that they need highly oxygenated water uh, to survive and to breathe. So not only can they handle the current in the streams, but they need that. And in the same way you would think about trout, you know, they basically need trout stream style habitat. Uh, waterfalls, all that kind of stuff is fine with them, but if it's stagnant water, they're not in it. Um, as it happens, Hawaii doesn't, or originally probably didn't have a lot of stagnant water. Um, you know, streams are going pretty steeply downhill and then out to the to the ocean. So uh, that seems to work for them. But that must have worked for parasitoids too, I'd imagine, to get into you know the water to hunt the aquatic hypozmicoma. Yeah, and again, I would just say, oh, do you find the two opening case leps in running water? Good question. So only single opening case types in water. Uh, and that's uh, your bugle case types, your burrito case types, and uh, your cone case types. Those are the ones that are in the water and they're all single opening. Um, so we originally thought maybe they're doing an air bubble, but uh, when we dissected them, which we did repeatedly, we found no evidence of an air bubble in there. We did uh, SEMs on them thinking we might see gills or something like that. And we saw nothing of, of that sort. So our guess is that the water is so highly oxygenated that they're able to do direct transpiration uh, when they're underwater and then just breathe normally when they're outside of the water because they're able to be fully terrestrial or fully aquatic. Um, none of them that we're aware of can handle salty water. Uh, we haven't seen them in the ocean or anything like that. So, so that, they haven't done that yet or aren't still doing it. Um, but uh, aquatic species have gill structures or absorbing oxygen without. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
yeah, I think I think that I have covered those questions. Any any others? You guys have been a great audience, by the way. I mean, I know it's been quiet, but uh, just the number of questions is really fun. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, you wouldn't always take for granted that talking about tiny moths and a remote island chain would be, you know, interesting. So I appreciate it. Um, and there's another video I was going to show you of a hypospin coma attacking another hypospin coma larva and eating it. Um, but I should ask Alan if I have time to do that. Um, it's really up to you, Dan. Like we're we're uh, happy to keep asking you questions or Alan, watching. I, think. I, can't I know you have if to go at some point. Me so. or not. Oh yes, please. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, let me. I'm going to share screen, so we should be good. And what's neat about this is we haven't seen this before. Um, this is, is unpublished stuff that's that's recent. But you've got your uh, your carnivore here, and then that's a candy wrapper next to it. He's chewing on the edge of the candy wrapper. And if you look, you can see the candy wrapper at the base there is peeking its head out and trying to fend him off or her off, but there, you can see the candy wrappers is popped out and is trying to figure out what's going on. And the carnivore is boring into the side of its case. And here you can see it's boring in again, chewing through the case. Uh, for some reason, the candy wrapper thinks hiding out in the case is a good idea. Um, I will say that if they're out of their cases, they die pretty quickly. So it may not have had a choice, but, uh, but what happens here is the case is chewed open. You can see there's the head of the candy wrapper. Here's the head of the carnivore coming in after it. It's very dramatic. Um, there are no sound effects, but you can imagine what happens in there. Here's the carnivore brewing his head into the candy wrapper case and eating it in there. So uh, there, you can kind of see what's happening. Well, hopefully you can see. Carnivore case here, candy wrapper case here. It's wobbling back and forth as he presumably, or it, presumably eats the candy wrapper larva inside the candy wrapper case. Um, interestingly, it doesn't spin them down like the snail eaters do. Um, and obviously the uh, snail eating hypothesmacoma aren't, um, how do I say it? Uh, actually, I'll stop sharing. The snail eating hypothesmacoma aren't chewing through the shell at all. So these guys are able to figure out that the cases of other hypothesmacoma hide treats and chewing through them is gonna provide that. Uh, and again, the, the thing about that that's different from I think other predatory caterpillars is if you're eating aphids, you take one bite and you're getting an immediate reward, right? You're getting hemolymph, you're getting sugars. Yeah, this is a good idea, let's keep doing this. But for hypothesmacoma, the first thing you do is chew on a silk case that has probably no nutritional value. They don't eat silk cases normally. And you have to do this for a while, as you can see there, before you're finally getting into a nutritional benefit. And if you're doing the snail eating ones, you have to go through this whole elaborate process of spinning it down first before you get to come around and, and get into the, the food either. So to me, in an evolutionary sense, it indicates a more complicated pattern. Uh, I'd love to understand that better. But uh, the, the funny thing is we don't see a lot of stepping stones. The CSI case is probably the only clue that there is a stepping stone. Um, because it doesn't attack other living organisms. But if you crush a fly pupa, for example, the CSI case will come in and eat it, but it won't attack a, a live one. So again, this is a total hypothesis, but we assume that they're crawling around and nibbling on things. And then maybe at some point the carnivores started actually attacking things uh, without getting that benefit. But how you jump from that to this sort of pre-planned attack where you're gonna chew through a case or spin down a shell first, I'm not really sure how that happened. Um, and to me, that's, that's what's weird. Yeah, and, and the physiological plasticity to go from herbivory to carnivory. And, and we don't find ones that are, that are doing both, right? They're, you can't rear a carnivore on, you can't even rear it on a, a fungus or something like that, which you think might have some protein. It has to be alive or, or recently dead. So, uh, you know, one thing we will do, as I mentioned, is we'll crush fly pupae and put them in there and they'll go and, and they'll concede to eating that because, you know, the hemolymph is coming out. But in nature, we don't have any evidence of them eating flies. Um, they, they're eating other, they're eating snails or more recently, they're eating other hypospecoma. And, and not just casually, right? 
you, I can rear a whole bunch of cone case typosmacoma in one petri dish and nobody's eating anybody else. This isn't like catocala larvae, which are famously cannibalistic or lots of noctuids where if you rear them together and they find each other, they'll eat each other. No other hyposmacoma do this. So, you know, it's clearly something they've made a step for. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to, to, to get into the genomics of this and, and figure out why, you know, what, what parts of, of, you know, the P450s or whatever it is that they, they've got have changed that have allowed them to do this. Behaviorally, it's gonna be hard, but at least if we can see physiologically how they're able to do it, I think that would be pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, that's our next step. Thanks for letting me show that extra video. I, I was worried there would be time. No, thank you, Dan. Thanks so much for the really awesome uh, presentation. I, can't I don't hear think we've out. ever had this much questions. Can. It's kind of hard for us to give you a round of applause, but uh, just know that we're all either clapping at I our own little places or, or clapping mentally. I see Alan's thing going, but. Well, Neil, you hear me? Yeah, I, that's really weird. I apologize for that. That was me. Alan, what did you say? Oh, I was just saying thanks so much for the really awesome talk. Okay. It's hard for us to uh, give you a well-deserved round of applause, but we're all clapping in our individual places or clapping mentally. I did see the motions. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys very much, sincerely. Uh, thanks for inviting me. This is my first time uh, interacting with you guys. and it, It's really fun. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so Here's much, Dan. Me. That was great. Yeah. So let's all go for beers. <laughs> <laughs> Someday. After the dentist appointment. <laughs> yeah, I know. We've got about 10 minutes. Cool. Thanks, Thank you Dan. very much Appreciate for the invitation. You. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thanks. All right. That was that was a great talk. Thank you, Dan. Uh, pretty incredible group of insects there. Um, and so now we'll move on to the rest of our, our, our business meeting. Do we have uh, Gary Hebel on the line? I see Gary. I think you're muted right now, Gary. <laughs> there you go. And so, yeah, we can hear you. And Gary will read the minutes from, from the last meeting. It was a very busy meeting. And um, if you'll bear with me, I, it'll end after two pages. So bear with me. The 1217th regular meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington convened at 7 p.m. on the 7th of January, 2021. Again, in the form of a virtual meeting by use of a Zoom application. A total of 44 members and guests attended the gathering. President Jamie Zenizer began with the following statement. Welcome to the 1217th meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington on January the 7th, 2021. This meeting comes in the wake of unprecedented upheaval in Washington, D.C. and breaching of the Capitol building. The Capitol building is situated just down the National Mall within eyesight of the National Museum, <clears throat> Museum of Natural History, where under normal circumstances, our monthly member meetings are held. Due to security precautions taken by the city, including road closures and do work restrictions, related to the pandemic, few, if any, entomology staff were working at the museum on Wednesday, January the 6th. As far as I am aware, all members of our entomological community are safe and there was no damage to the Museum of Natural History. We all hope that remain, that remains so and that peace and stability are returned to our nation's capital as appears to already be the case. These events are very concerning to say the least, but because our monthly member meetings are now completely online due to COVID meeting restrictions, we are able to continue with our meetings as planned. I'm happy that you are all able to join us tonight. President Zenizer then welcomed the following newly elected ESW officers. Lourdes Chamorro as president elect Alan Norbaum as program chair, and Elizabeth Young as membership and communications secretary. Cheryl O'Donnell proceeds from president 
to past president as Jimmy Zonizer proceeds from president-elect to president. Returning officers are Nick Silverson as curator, Gary Hevel as recording secretary, Abigail Kula as treasurer, and Mark Mepp as editor. <clears throat> president Zonizer then summarized the events of the past year as being unprecedented in many ways. The COVID-19 restrictions ended our in-person meetings early in, in 2020, causing us to cancel the member meetings scheduled for April and May of 2020 and our annual banquet in June before our scheduled summer break. For the first time in our history, we turned to an online format for our monthly meeting, which began in October. We look forward to the time when we can again gather in person, but the online format has clearly had a benefit in member attendance for those who live dist distantly or who otherwise would have uh, attendance difficulties. In this sense, it is a welcome change and we hope to be able to provide an online option for meeting attendance even after in-person meetings resume, hopefully later this year. Further, President Zenizer asked for renewal of ESW memberships. A new Google form was created by Treasurer Abby Kula and the link to the form was provided in two email notifications to the society's membership. The new form is very easy to use and will facilitate fast processing of membership and fees. The traditional forms of renewal are still available via the website, but if possible, please use the new form linked in the email. President Zenizer then asked Recording Secretary Gary Hevel to read the minutes of a December meeting. <coughs> after the meeting, after the reading, the minutes were approved by meeting attendees. Shown on screen were the email addresses of five ESW members which in, in attempted contact had bounced back. Anyone recognizing the individuals connected to these addresses should contact Alan Norbaum. Membership and Communications Secretary Elizabeth Young noted one new society application from Tanner Matson. For new business, President Zonizer offered the following notices after which followed a moment of silence. Very recently, two active members of our community have passed away, those being Dr. Howard Robinson, primarily a botanist working on mosses and the plant family Asperaceae, and who served as a curator in the botany department at NMH, NMMH for most of his career. He also held a side interest in dolichopoded flies on which he specialized and was he was an active member of ESW at the time of his passing in December of 2020. Dr. Dennis Kopp was a native of Iowa and earned his master's and PhD degrees in entomology at the University of Missouri, Columbia, where he focused on the taxonomy and systematics of tree hoppers in the family Membracidae. He went on to become a professor and extension entomologist at North Dakota State University for 13 years. In 1990, he accepted a position with the USDA Cooperative Extension Service in Washington, DC. And in 1996, he became plant sections leader for the Cooperative States Research, Education and Extension Service, CSREES, which in 20, 2008 became the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Dennis was an active member in many sectors of the entomological community and was known and loved by many. He became a fellow of the Entomological Society of America in 2010. In retirement, Dennis volunteered two days every week working in the Heteroptera collection at NMNH and was a regular attendee of our in-person meetings of ESW. On a personal note, I will dearly miss seeing and chatting with Dennis, who became a good friend to me during the several years I have been working at the museum. Dennis passed away in December 2020. We send condolences to their family and friends. They will be missed. 
For the presentation of notes and exhibitions of specimens, Lourdes Chamorro brought to the screen a large book titled Bug Bingo. It was a gift from Andy Polichek of the Museum of Natural History in London and included entomological illustrations featuring members of the trichogrammatid wasp genus Megaphragma. Matt Buffington offered a photograph of a specimen of the so-called murder hornet, murder hornet, Vespa mandarinia, mandarinia. The specimen had recently been sent from Washington where it had been used to detect other individuals of this invasive wasp with the use of radio locators. Matt and Floyd Shockley, collections manager of the Department of Entomology, have been developing a display of the wasp that hopefully will be placed in the NMNA insect zoo. Alan Norborn showed a copy of a fest shrift edition from the Israel Journal of Entomology that honored Amnon Friedberg last year. Amnon, a taxonomic diptrist and eager collector, died later in the year. Ed Burroughs provided images of a leaf of the plant Viola sororia with the development of a trice pile on the back of an immature lacewing. Program chair Alan Norbaum introduced the speaker, speaker of the evening, Cheryl O'Donnell, past president of the ESW, whose topic was, did you check your Christmas tree for thrips? Cheryl reviewed the development in working with her development in working with thrips. In earlier work, she was not a taxonomic specialist. She began her career as a government identifier, working at ports in Florida and California to detect invading thrips. With a series of photographic images, Cheryl showed the fringes of wings of thrips. Thrips may or may not have wings. They are found on all continents and some are parasitic on hemiptera. There is morphological and molecular support for their relationships to hemiptera. There were two suborders, there are two suborders for thrips, Tubulifera and Terrablantia. The subfamily Thrapini contain many pests and may transmit viruses. Life stages include eggs, first instar, second instar, pre-pupae, pupae, and adults. Males are smaller and lighter in color. Thrips have atrophied mandibles and have long been known as exceptions to bilateral symmetry. <laughs> 105 species of thrips in the genus Skirtothrips, 15 in the United States. Skirtothrips dorsalis was introduced in Florida in 1991 and damaged numerous hosts. Skirtothrips persei was introduced in California in 1997 and decimated the avocado industry. Reports from Pennsylvania of damaged Christmas trees led Cheryl to go there to make collections. She arrived there during heavy rainstorms and flooding conditions and she doubted collecting success. However, she was able to collect thousands of individuals including eggs and larvae. The trees were in sad shape with damaged cones and needles dropping dramatically. There were no known species in the genus that had, been, had Aves as a host. Cheryl consulted with many of her colleagues, asking if they knew of any Skirtothrips species associated with Aves. Careful examination revealed that these specimens were not known to science. So Cheryl is naming them as a new species, Skirtothrips abiates. abiates. This research expected to be published in 2021. The meeting was adjourned at 8.25 p.m. Okay, thank you, Gary. Does anybody have any changes or additions to, to the minutes? Would somebody like to uh, propose a motion to approve the minutes as read? Motion. Second. With the second motion and second, the minutes are approved. Okay, next section is reports from officers and committees. Any officers 
have have a report. Al, do you want to announce the next meeting now, or do you want to do that later? I can just quickly uh, let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Does anybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, I'll just give you a quick preview of uh, the speakers at the next meeting. Whoops, what did I do? Sorry, having trouble. Uh, the next meeting, the, the speakers are going to be um, Elaine Hippie and Andrew Forbes from the University of Iowa. They're talking about a really cool group of flies called Strausia. Um, not quite as diverse as the caterpillars uh, Dan was talking about tonight, but, but they're still pretty cool. So I hope you can all uh, join us for that. Let's see, how do I unshare? Should be at the bottom of the screen, I think. Oh, it is at the top of the top. There it is. Okay. Sorry oh, okay. about that. I'm still a little bit new to Zoom. Yep. We're all learning. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other reports from officers? Yeah, I have a report. I'm not an officer, but I don't know if we have any. Okay, go ahead, Dave. This will right. be. Mm -hmm. um, for those that are new, I'm the coordinator uh, for the young entomologist group. Uh, last year, uh, we started our year, uh, and normally we do in February after the holidays. And uh, we went till March and were abruptly stopped by the uh, COVID virus. Uh, so this year, uh, we're going to go virtual, and uh, we're starting this month uh, on Saturday, February 13th. Uh, Ian Emanuel, one of our young entomologist uh, interns, uh, will talk about uh, Jack in the Pulpits in uh, the Northeast, uh, and specifically in the areas of his research, uh, which was on uh, the large jack in the pulpit that you find in mature forest. Um, and on March 20th, uh, Dana DeRoche, our spider woman, uh, will be talking about the identification of spiders and um, some of their um, particular nuances for helping with uh, identifications and the use of silk. Uh, so that's the first two uh, presentations and there'll be more announcements as we go through the year. Okay, thanks Dave for the update on the Young Entomologist Group. Next up is introduction of new members and visitors. Elizabeth, do we have any new members? Yes, uh, we do have one new member. Um, their name is Alejandro Estrada. I think they were present for the meeting and um, excited to have them on. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, that's, that's it. Excellent, thank you. Welcome Alejandro. Do we have any visitors that would like to introduce themselves? Okay, no problem. Um, next section is uh, unfinished business. I just wanted to uh, reiterate to please renew your membership if you haven't already done so. If you go into the chat and scroll all the way to the top, uh, I included a couple of links. One, the first link is to the new Google form that was made that you can renew your membership or I think you can also become a new member that way. Or you can also visit the, the website member uh, page and sign up uh, as a new or renewing member there too. Both of those links are there in the chat at the top. On to, uh, well, do we have any other unfinished business? Okay, on to new business. Uh, let's see, anybody have new business? 
Well, I'm not sure if this might be new business or not, um, but the fact that we might be moving the annual banquet to a different uh, date. Okay, great. Thank you, Lourdes. Uh, so normally the, the banquet is held in June. And so we're considering sometime later, possibly September right now. That's right. Very good to know. Thank you. The one thing I wanted to bring up was that on Tuesday of this week, the executive committee of the Entomological Society of Washington approved a special issue to be published probably sometime in 2022. And details of that will be forthcoming later. Um, and so well, we're excited for that. Any other new business? Okay, and on to the last section before we adjourned. Uh, does anybody have any notes or specimens or new books of interest that they wanted to show? Show and tell time. All right, looks like we don't have a whole lot, but that was a great meeting. Thank you for everybody for coming. Does anybody have any, any last minute comments, suggestions, questions? Who's our next speaker? Um, or was that already mentioned? Yeah, it's um, Elaine Hippie and um, Andrew Forbes from the University of Iowa. They're talking about Straussia. It's a, it's a tephritid genus, which feed on sunflowers and other uh, related things. They're, they're really cool flies. The sunflowers you planted in your yard, you could end up with Straussia on. <laughs> great, great, thank, <laughs> great, thank you. <laughs> That's wonderful. Cool, and of course, that'll be on the first Thursday of March. I think that's March 4th at 7, 7 p.m. again, right here on Zoom. And we'll send out an email announcement and reminder. Anything and, and else? Not, and now they've been shared through social media. So to, to get more um, retweets perhaps or shares, uh, that, that would be great. Um, so watch out for, uh, well, Elizabeth can say a little bit more about that, but uh, there's the campaign to get the announcement out ahead of time and um, and then get those retweeted and so on so that more people. Uh, yeah, show yeah that's, that's true. Um, <laughs> I'd like to be a little bit more active on our social media accounts. Uh, we've got a Facebook page, a Twitter page, and an Instagram account. So uh, if you'd like to follow us there, um, hopefully we're going to be posting a lot more, um, especially about our upcoming meetings. Awesome. Um, Elizabeth, I usually send out, or uh, I'm trying anyway, to send out an announcement like two weeks ahead of time. Do you want to try to put that on social media, or is that like too far away from the meeting time? Is it better to do it like the day of to... Okay. I, or, or both. I, I think both is good. Yeah, I would think um, maybe two or just a week before and then once again the day of. Um, I, I am no expert in social media, but um, it would be nice to have a, a more engagement. Uh, and I just think posting more often would do that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, thank you. And again, you know, I think attendance was great tonight. I saw at least at one point over 70 people. So um, the more the merrier. So excellent. Okay, any, anybody else with, with anything else? Okay, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Would anybody like Second. to say? Second. Second. Okay, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Great job. Yes. Yeah. See you. Thanks, Jamie. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.
Yes, so I don't know. Do you normally just end it or do I do you wait till everybody yep. kind of goes off? So I'll end it and then you should get um, it recorded onto your computer, but don't worry about that. I can go into 